<laughs> so my name's Lee Holmes, a uh, developer on the PowerShell team. I've been doing a bunch of the, uh, the security work, and uh, you know, it's one of the things that we think about all the, all the time. You know, we hear a bunch of things happening on the, you know, the news now about <coughs> viruses and bash bugs and stuff. Yeah. You know, we don't think we're immune. We've been working really hard in thinking through these scenarios, so um, you know, it's, it's not a time for us to sit back and relax and go, you know, it's been pretty good so far. You know, we really want to keep our vil vigilance up. But what I wanted to talk about a bit today was using PowerShell for sort of incident response, um, how to detect what's happening with PowerShell on your systems, and also some improvements that we've made in the last uh, WMF, so PowerShell version 5 coming up, that you can start to use um, as you go forward. So uh, just to get an expectation, how many people here consider themselves like, you know, one of the primary IT admins, ops, sort of owners of the infrastructure? Now, of this crowd, keep them up. How many people have a, you know, a specialized, separate security team? A lot of hands went down, but you can put it back up because you are that specialized security team. Because it's, if it's not them, it's you. So we've been hearing a lot about PowerShell in the news. You hear about you know, PowerSploit, and you hear about some of the presentations that have been happening in DEF CON, for example. And it's been really interesting to see that PowerShell is getting a bunch of new friends. <laughs> now, the security <laughs> research community is, is a really interesting beast, right? So they're just like us. They like to do fun stuff, uh, mentally challenging things, and break new ground. Now, where this happens in the security community is around, uh, let's say, for example, penetration testing, where they say, I was able to get into this, into this corporation. Here's a bunch of crazy stuff I can do. Now, a couple of years ago, there was a you know, presentation in DEF CON that showed, hey, this really powerful thing called PowerShell is on the box. I can do fun stuff with it. Now, once that happens, everything old is new again. And so people are saying, we had these old techniques that we were using back with uh, C++ and protecting against AV. Now I can do this in PowerShell. And so a bunch of things are becoming interesting and fun now because they're possible with PowerShell. Now what I wanted to really set as a baseline for all of this, there's a very important concept in, in security called security boundaries. Every single one of these presentations at conferences have talked about once I've popped your domain, so I've got your domain admin running arbitrary code, or I've got somebody on your machine running arbitrary code. Once this has happened, they can literally do anything. So somebody, if you say, you know what, you're my worst enemy, but I'll let you run any single command line executable on Windows, that is not your machine anymore, that is not your domain anymore. So that's called post-exploitation. There was a previous thing that let that happen. So you wrote a, uh, a web application that had SQL injection. Somehow they were able to escape their way out from this untrusted world of the internet and get their way into running an arbitrary Windows command. So that's really the context here, are attackers that are using PowerShell in the context of post-exploitation. So they got somebody to double-click on a bad PDF or got somebody to run an exe that they crafted. So that's what we're going to talk about here is there is post-exploitation and how people are using PowerShell. Now what I wanted to talk about is in this post-exploitation world, there is a whole slew of things. And now we're PowerShell people. PowerShell is becoming popular in the security community. And it's also now starting to make noise in the news, right? So uh, antivirus vendors are, have incentive to start talking about new and exotic attacks. So you'll hear about a PowerShell virus on, on a website, or you'll hear, hear about a new PowerShell attack. And so, you know, one of the first things to think about here is how does this compare to everything else that you should be doing? Because being interested in basically the end game, which is a, a PowerShell attack, there's also a couple things that are being taken for, uh, you know, in terms of context. Now, the kind of things you want to do in terms of protecting yourself against 
post exploitation are application whitelisting, so app locker, SRP, auditing, audit policies, active active monitoring, in-house forensics. So I, I like to think about this in terms of a Maslow's hierarchy. You know, we have it for like human nature, right? You got to get water, got to get food, and eventually you're at some point where once you've got all of these baselines and things that you've got, then you can start thinking about the next things. So if, if you've got somebody coming up to you and saying, we need to really lock down against PowerShell attacks, and we need to really make sure that we're doing the best we can to detect PowerShell stuff, really it's important to step back and make sure that we've got our bases covered first. Now the first part there is around application whitelisting. Now if, if you don't have application whitelisting in, there is literally anything an attacker can do. They can go onto their home machine and then they can compile a random C++ or C Sharp or assembly executable. And once they've, they've compromised a machine, they can take their code that can literally do anything on that machine. And so if you don't have application whitelisting, then at that point, it doesn't matter how they chose to do it. They could do it with VBScript, PowerShell, CMD.exe, custom SQL statements, pretty much anything. That's the second question. <laughs> there, you know, there are people who really lock down their environments this way, but I think it's really important to make sure this is like the top thing in our minds, that if, if you haven't got application whitelisting going on, then you don't have to worry about the crazy stuff people are doing with PowerShell, because you're not worrying already about the crazy stuff they can do with C++. So it's really important to know that we're talking a, a ground up thing here. The second thing comes to, let's say you've got in these protections. So you've got app locker, it's in whitelisting only mode. Now how do you detect if somebody that actually manages to get admin on a machine and from there they go and change the app locker policy? So that's where you start saying, even once they've got protection set up, I do need to audit those things. Because if you're not auditing them, again they just change it and they have their merry way with you. Um, now once, pretend you've got auditing, so these things do leave audit details and we'll talk about them a little bit, but when you change app locker, these things end up being registry changes and you can send these things back through event log monitoring and other things. So you want to make sure you're protecting yourself against that because otherwise, again, they can have their way with you. Now one of the things you hear about PowerShell is that it's forensically clean. So that is what is sort of being a big fashionable thing in the security community is because they're able to use PowerShell in a way that, for example, they can dump the hashes out of the registry and it's not leaving a trace on disk, it's not leaving a trace in the registry. So they're really happy that I can do this even if you have registry and file-based monitoring going on. But the point there is that Forensically clean is only important if you've got forensics. So forensics, it says, you know, somebody <coughs> created a scheduled task temporarily, or somebody used the inbox, you know, csharp.exe, to create an application. Now these things do leave a temporary on disk footprint, but that only matters if you're able to say, this server is compromised, take a disk image, send it to somebody who can take a look at the NTFS data structures, and figure out if there is a, a temporary C sharp file dumped onto disk and then erased afterwards. So forensically clean is only <laughs> a, a, an interesting thing once you actually have the capability to do anything with those forensics. So just you know, setting the context here, worrying about forensically clean PowerShell should be at the end of a very long line of things that you should be considering and working on. So I touched on it a little bit, but all of this stuff has, has been present for a long time. So there's been old school methods. You know, you've got VB script that can do a bunch of stuff. Anything that's interpreted on the box, so Perl or Python, you know, these things aren't necessarily logged. They can be done in frantically clean manners. So basically a bunch of different ways and PowerShell is becoming a new way. Security researchers, are enjoying the power of it 
the you know the utility of it just as much as we are. Now the way that they're doing some of this stuff with PowerShell is that PowerShell has direct access to .NET, and that is pretty much the fundamental <coughs> thing. You're able to have a arbitrary C# -sharp program, but that just ran from a script in memory. Now, where you might have done this before in VBScript, if you're an attacker and being forced to use VBScript, for example, you can have a VBScript that uses the, the ability to do an ActiveX request to the website, pull another VBScript down, and run an eval statement on that. That's an example of a VBScript that does a bunch of stuff that doesn't leave any on-disk footprint. Now, in PowerShell, they just love it because you've got um, add type, they, they like to avoid add type because for you know, a millisecond, there's a C-sharp file on disk that represents the code. So they like to avoid that, but you've got other things in .NET that are much more difficult in terms of .NET APIs. They let you create classes and run .NET stuff uh, kind of automatically. Now, I'm not going to get into this too far, but the problem really comes from People say, I'm really worried about my admins getting compromised because there is really no difference between the administrator and the operating system. You know, that's kind of the, the role of an administrator is to be able to install arbitrary drivers, run things like, you know, the sys internals tools. These are all really important things interacting with really sensitive data structures. So what they want is a way to say, I've got an administrator of this box, like that's the job of them is to add drivers, you know, mess around with Windows files sometimes, install patches, install updates. But I just, I really, I want them to administer the system, but I don't want them to be running some sort of VB script that's jumping off to the net and pulling up stuff and invoking arbitrary code. Or I don't want them running PowerShell that's interacting with a .NET framework and running crazy stuff. Now the problem there is that we've given them, as, as IT, we've given them too much permission. We don't want them to be installing arbitrary kernel modules. Now the answer to that is just enough admin. So PowerShell has had the ability to restrict what somebody can do for a long time. You know, the initial release of PowerShell Remoting had the capability to do constrained endpoints <coughs> that lock down what somebody can do based on a startup script. So, you know, when I connect to your servers, maybe you're saying, I'll let him check an audit log, but I'm not going to let him change any audit policies. Now, Jeffrey is doing a crazy amount of work, and there's a bunch of great sessions from TechEd and stuff to watch that say, if I'm in this position where I've got an administrator, he runs some bad executable, he doesn't have full control over the server. I can say, you know, I trust you, but I don't trust the people who are trying to attack you and getting you to run malicious stuff. So what you do here is you create a, an endpoint that gives you a list of things you can do, and that is going to be their, their permission set. So the, the true the problem is giving people unfettered permission to your environment and not locking that down. But let's pretend all of that stuff is a problem. And, and people often wonder, how do I actually get started with, you know, I know there's all this potential bad stuff happening on my servers. You know, how do I know when somebody's messing with an audit policy? How do I know if somebody has run uh, Mimikatz, you know, this thing I keep on hearing about that can be run on my servers and dump all the passwords from people who are currently logged on? Now, a lot of times you can go off and you can spend your bunch, a bunch, a bunch of money on getting intrusion detection systems, um, put them all across your enterprise, and hey, there you got some intrusion detection going on. Now, it turns out that Windows already has something that's a very, very great starter for this, which is Windows event forwarding. There is, um, there's an awesome thing you can get actually from um, I think it's the NSA that talks about detecting the adversary with Windows event forwarding. And it's a great document that goes through how to set it up, some things that you can start to look for. Now the thing is, once you set this up, it's not going to magically detect intruders. But it, what it can help do is 
get this stuff up into a place that you can secure, that you can monitor, that you can kind of look through and investigate to say, you know what, I don't know. Why is Joe doing PowerShell remoting to the HR system? He's never done that before. Having that, that information that you can query, that you can question, that you can look back if a server starts acting weird, that is really important and is built into Windows for a very long time. And so we're going to actually go through right now how to set that up and how to enable yourself to start to figure out what can go. And it's, it's a very powerful system. In um, a large corporation I happen to know, with um, 400,000 monitored computers, how many collectors would you say you would need to do large scale event forwarding? Who says like 400,000 computers over 200 collectors? Who thinks that? More or less? All right, how about let's say over 100? Over 50? So for 400,000 computers with a bunch of developers, a bunch of testers, 36 boxes. So that's, that's massive scale. It's, it's not an expensive thing to set up to get the kind of investment in your security and your ability to detect things. So there's a couple of steps here. You've got, a, you've got a domain controller, if you want to do it this way. A lot of stuff is policy driven, which can um, have an event source. So you have 400,000 machines, those are event sources. Now, you've got an event collector that is basically taking the selected event logs from these 400,000 machines and collecting them into a, into a single event log. Now, these event sources can be told to connect to a collector by group policy, and it's a pretty easy thing to do. So we're going to go over that right now. So just kind of before we go on a bit, with that as a context, is there any kind of questions about anything specific about PowerShell in the news or uh, WEF or anything we're about to set up? Yes? Yeah, maybe a bit unrelated, but how, how does it come in with the, the bypass uh, when you start PowerShell? Right, so the question was, what about PowerShell has the execution policy bypass? Right, so that's, you see that in all the attack presentations are doing, look at this, I can just bypass the execution policy, I'm, I'm golden. The answer there is that the execution policy is, it's a, it's a preference for you as an administrator. The execution policy is saying, I don't want to run scripts from the internet unless I personally usher them in and I, I say that I trust them. Or I might want to say, I personally don't want to run any scripts that haven't been signed by a person that I trust. But the fact that an attacker was able to run anything they wanted on your machine, the fact that they picked execution by policy bypass, that, that's really, they could have done something else, right? Dash command, whatever. Or they could have run VB script pulling from the web or anything else. So the execution policy has never been a way that says PowerShell will never run anything evil. That's, that's, it's not the same thing as antivirus or anything else. We did make the mistake in PowerShell version 1 where the execution policy was stored just because it's a thing that you want to do system-wide, we had it stored in HKey local machine. And a natural thing for that is that, oh, well, regular users can't change it. So then you had people trying to push down execution policies that said, I don't want my users to run unsigned scripts. And then the users go, I don't care, I'm just typing in this prompt anyways. So it, we, do, we do not want that to be considered as a security boundary. <coughs> now what we're going to connect to here, mass ponage serve, is my, is my event collector. And we'll show you how easy it is to set up
Now the first thing you want to do here is the Windows event collector. So you run w e c util quick config, and this looks a lot like what you used to see with WinRM quick config. And the reason is because it was largely the same people. So by default, it's disabled. But you don't want most machines to be a collector. So now you've got a collector, and what this collector is now doing is it's listening on WSMAN for any collections, uh, for any clients connecting to it and asking, hey, what should I be listening to? What events do you want? So now I just opened up that. There is not, but you have got some good experience now. So, <laughs> Now, where a lot of the configuration happens is in the DC. Uh, and this is kind of coming down to the point of how do you configure one of these things. Now it really um, kind of comes into two places. One way that's useful to manage the Windows event forwarding is to go and create a, an active, active Directory group for them. Now machines that you want to be monitored, you just stick them into that group and apply the group policy to that group. And then they'll start collecting. I'm not going to show, uh, show that example right now, but it won't actually work because you need to reboot a machine for it to become a member of a group, and I'm not going to do that. <coughs> Steve? Uh, is there, is there a BSC resource for that? Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> this is a big crowd. Got a lot of DSC <laughs> options. <laughs> By the time I'm done, Steve, I expect one. <laughs> yeah. So what we're going to do here is we're going to create a domain uh, GPO and link it. So we're going to call this event monitoring. <laughs> now, the two primary places that these go, so this is the policy that we're going to be pushing down to all of the clients. The first one is the event forwarding policy, and it's configure the target subscription manager. We're going to enable it, and we're going to see the, the subscription manager <coughs> is who a client is going to connect to to find out what events should get pushed. Now the challenge with this is um, people who deal with IT and servers a lot, which you'll notice here, it does show you a really good job of the following syntax. And, and you say, OK, well, server is this. And you'll start off HTTPS. Server equals is literally part of what you need to do. So don't ignore that. Server equals. Now, here we're saying HTTP or HTTPS. Now, by default, you can use HTTP. This is based on WinRM making these connections, which is the same thing as PowerShell remoting. Now, within a domain, you can safely use HTTP because you've got Kerberos as your authentication protocol protecting everything. So you don't have to worry about somebody sniffing these events as they're going back and forth because the domain communication is protecting them. So we don't need to do this in HTTP. HTTP, unless you're going off and talking 
cross domain or where there isn't trusts where Kerberos won't be able to do that. And I'll show you a bit about that in a second. And really, all you're doing is copying pasting here, but with your fingers. Yeah? Can this be set up in a highly available way or a load balance way? Yeah, there is avail uh, the ability here. You see this is a multi-select? <coughs> so you can give it a couple. And so in a large corporation, I happen to know, uh, they tend to have four or five <laughs> that they'll kind of try in the case of issues. I don't, uh, so the, sorry, the question that first Steve asked was, can you set these up to go to multiple servers for highly available? Yeah. And the answer was yes, you can do it by multiple entries here. Then, then you're just asking, can I do this in a, uh, isn't this an issue where I was trying to centralize them and now I've got these collectors that are decentralized? And the answer there is that you're always in a reasonably large uh, situation, you're gonna have multiple and you're going to still probably not want to use the collector as your main data source. You're still going to go through a final step of dumping this stuff into SQL or into Azure or Hadoop or Splunk or anything like that. That's where you're going to do tons and tons of your work. So WEC is the Windows Event Collector and the ref refresh equals 30 is saying just refresh every 30 seconds. So this is the primary configuration. There's one more configuration that we're going to change right now, which is the ability of people to read event logs on a computer is restricted to this group called event log readers. By default, WSMAN, which is doing this, this collection of events on your behalf, runs as network service. That's not part of that group by default. So we're also going to apply a group policy that adds the event log readers as uh, network service to that. Oh, wait, so that was the event subscriber, the subscription manager. So is that the thing that tells it what to collect, or does it tell it where to where to push it? When so the question was the setting that we just set. Is that telling? where to put the events or where to collect them from. Is that correct? Or, or where to uh, get, figure out what to collect. So the, the, the answer to that is that all these clients are going to go to this, this URL. That URL is going to say, um, yes, report your events to me. These are the events that I want you to report. And we'll actually go through that, that setting in a second here. So this restricted groups is the place where this next policy goes in. Now we just added the ability for network service, which is WSMAN, to start to read the event logs and collect them on behalf of the collector. So these two settings are pushed to all of the 600,000 machines that you're, that you're working on. Now we can enforce it, and the next time the clients are doing a refresh. But we've got an issue here is that we're, we haven't set up the collector yet to tell the clients what to do. <laughs> so now I'm in the collector again. And I mentioned this is really a fundamentally an event log based thing.
Now, you've probably seen this subscriptions tab at the bottom of event logs for three quarters of your IT career and not knowing what it, what it does. So let's find out. What we're doing here is we're going to create a new subscription. Now, the subscription name, you can't change this, so think long and hard. Maybe have a team meeting that says, what should we rename this? Because if you get annoyed by it uh, in you know, a couple months, I'm going to have to go through a change control process. So we're going to call this uh, you know, security baseline. And you can tell it which channel to go in. So this is going to be the forwarded events channel. Now, collector initiated is where you're going to have that collector going out and spamming your, you know, your, your cloud. Source computer is really the most scalable one. This is where the machines themselves are going to go to the collector, ask what they should do, and send back their stuff. Select computer groups. This is where you would say here the, the domain group for your event log, uh, you know, monitored computers, for example. So you need to be able, I was using a local admin to connect this and set it up. So you need to have access to the domain to know who's allowed to do this stuff. Now the second part you see here down here is the certs. This is if you need to connect in a work group situation where you want uh, encryption. Completely out of the blue, what is the host name of the collect machine? A mass pwnage serve. Oh, thanks. And then you select the events to collect, and we're going to talk about this as a, a baseline. Now, you've got a couple options here. You can go off and be pretty specific. Once you start tweaking this, you're going to get less and less interested, adding and removing checkboxes. You're going to want to support more power, and that's where you start to go into this XML world. Now, XML is really just an X path that is the same thing that you get from Event Viewer. Once you s sort of create a policy, you can export that as XML. Now, there's a bunch of great work that's been happening inside a large company that I know. And, um, they're working on getting this document out there. They're just kind of going through the process um, and scrubbing it. But one thing you do get once it's out, here's an interesting baseline query that's done a bunch of the hard work of a lot of smart engineers that once this is released, you'll be able to copy and paste and start a good, good query. One of the things that's really useful is to go into that NSA document that I was talking about. This query is annotated, but I can't share it right now. That document does talk about, here are important things to look for and, and what makes them useful. And this is the kind of thing that shares really easily, right? I was just copying and pasting it. <coughs> now, advanced, you want to often just minimize latency. They aren't expensive. And so, and it, you know, really not that many events per second. So have these things pinging your server every 30 seconds. It's just not a big deal. The faster you can get data off the machines, the better. Because the minutes off the machine in a collector, in a database, that machine can get totally compromised, and you still have historical data to go back and figure out what's happened. 
an attacker getting onto a machine is going to wipe the logs as soon as they have full control. That might give them away, so they might try to avoid it, but this way you're sure that even if they wipe the logs, they corrupt them, they do whatever they can, you still have historical data. So now we've got a thing set up. Yes, question. Would you make uh, a subscription per type of machine? For example, a different subscription on uh, web servers, or, or is it best practice to make just one big baseline, which collects all the events you want? You know, that's a good question. So the question was, does it make sense to make a subscription per type of machine? And that really comes down to uh, your domain expertise. So this, this baseline, and I think it's a good idea. So this baseline is around sort of arbitrary computers that people just deal with every day. But you can do a lot better, for example, to say on a web server, I'm going to be really cautious if I see any processes start except for a couple certain names. So you can be very, very narrow there and either limit your data volume or even expand it. And actually, a, a good implementation here is to say, there's machines that's just my baseline. There are machines where I'm starting to wonder, and you might turn up that dial a little bit, get more data volume coming back. And then machines that, even worst case, you actually know that something went wrong, and you just got it correct. We had a question. So if you would create a server hardening baseline, you would also create this? Yeah, that would be, the question was, if you were to create a server hardening baseline, would it make sense to create a, a query on how to know if it's had issues, and that's absolutely good. You can add a lot of subscriptions here. So my one subscription of potentially compromised servers or whatever, I can keep on adding more web servers, and this collector can be very specific on the machines it wants. So I've got a subscription going right now. I'm going to fix the bug. Um, no, you, you can still update these just by running GP update with a force. Okay, so you can crank it up at, uh, at runtime. I mean, a live machine then. The oh, sorry. So the question was, do we have to reboot for these policies to apply? And I incorrectly answered, you could do a GP update. Uh, the real answer is that the, the filtering and which kind of things that these users are listening for, that's actually configured just on the collector. And the machines are asking every 30 seconds, what should I... What should I give you? Another small question. <coughs> okay. Yes. Uh, if you load balance these or have several of these uh, collectors, do you have to make a subscription on every machine again and again? Because then if you have uh, lots of subscriptions, you have to do it over four or five machines. It can be a bit uh, errorful. So the question is, if you're setting up a load balance version of this, how do you configure the subscriptions yeah. in, in a sort of automatable way? The answer is there as there's actually some command line tools that a uh, couple of different documents out there describe how to do this stuff automatically. So setting the XPath, setting everything else. Um, I was just kind of walking you through the, the scenario first, but you can automate this uh, fully. Especially with DSC, the, um, there is no resource for it right now, but there are commands from the perspective of the local node how to do each thing. Lee, I think you still have a typo in your Oh man, that's why I'm not a URL typo person by uh, profession. <laughs> Sorry, I just leaked a product name. <laughs> All right, anything else from the gallery? <laughs> I'd like to get this working. All right, so let's go. And normally, 
we're going to connect All right, so now I'm at, this is just a regular machine being monitored. If there are any issues as you're digging into this, the event logs on the collector and the client are both very useful. The, the client will tell you if it's having issues connecting to, uh, to any of the collectors, and the collectors can tell you if you know, there's any issues with the clients that are connecting to it. Now you see here we've got one active computer. Now I've got a source that's connected to the, con uh, the collector and asking, hey, what do you want from me? Now here's that forwarded events that's been empty for the last 20 years. <laughs> and now we're actually connecting stuff. So you see, as part of the baseline, it's detected a, a terminal server session between two machines. <laughs> and so this is an example of now you can start in a, in a questionable situation. You can go back and say, this machine on Monday, I'm pretty sure did some bad stuff. I had AV flagging. I don't know what happened. You go back and say, you know what, 10 minutes after that, they started doing RDP to the domain controller, and it worked. And at least you can know how screwed you are rather than not know. <laughs> Yes. Is, you know, in the query thing, is this also where the server name that normally doesn't do anything comes into play as well, or not? You know, when you can specify a server, and normally there's no point to doing that. So the question is, in the query where you specify a server that normally doesn't do anything, <coughs> does this help with that? Um, is that specifically for the forwarded for dealing with the forwarded events on a specific? I, I think you can open up Event Viewer as long as you've got the right ports to talk to an event log on another machine. Um, so that's kind of the state of things. So now we've gotten to a point of monitoring the actual logs, right? So now we can actually start to detect what things are happening across our enterprise. And now you can start to ask interesting questions about, now you pretend you've got a VB script monitoring good. What kind of things are happening with PowerShell? Now let's do an addition here. Now we can even change the properties here to say refresh this query every minute. This is the part where it's completely configurable. Select events. Now here's where we can start to say, well, collect everything PowerShell has for me. Now we're going to collect all the PowerShell events. <laughs> Go back to minimizing latency. So now every 30 seconds, we'll find out anything that's happened from PowerShell here. So we've got 99 events. PowerShell has some interesting events. There's, uh, I'll show you in the appendix in a second, but Mandiant in the last Black Hat did an amazing presentation that talks about, specifically around the PowerShell expertise and domain knowledge, how do you know when somebody has launched a PowerShell instance or made a remoting connection between 
machine A, machine B. A lot of the times, remoting you can just detect with the baseline events of there was a, a Kerberos authentication between two machines, but knowing if they used PowerShell remoting is potentially an interesting signal for you too. Now the user just ran PowerShell and, and you decide this is an interesting thing. Now while this is going on, um, what we've done is in up until now there's been the ability for PowerShell to log any command you want. So one of the things that attackers sometimes enjoy, like I was saying, was the add type commandlet. So you can push down the group policy, and we have a great help file on about group policies that shows how to log every command PowerShell runs. So if they run add type, you're going to get a PowerShell event here that says, I ran, somebody ran add type, and what was the content? That's a very useful thing. So that's um, where we're at right now. I can, I can show you that, but when we talk about, and here's the big thing is forensically clean, that's because by default, interactive commands in any shell aren't logged anywhere. They're just, they kind of come and go. So we've got this situation here, so we know that all event logs of the stuff that you're interested in can get logged to event viewer you can put them into a, a, a SAM, you know, security event management, and do interesting queries. So let's talk about an addition we just made to the Windows Management Framework that just blows this stuff out of the water. Now I've, I've got the new Management Framework on this machine. We've, we've got some PowerShell. If I do something like this, that's not being logged anywhere right now. But what we do support is a policy that can let you also log anything that the PowerShell engine interprets. So as part of the latest WMF updates, we added a couple really important things. So one of them is system-wide transcripts. So a bunch of people have been very excited about us adding transcript support to the ISC. That's a huge, huge change. The truth is, we did not write any new code for the ISC. What we did is we made the mistake in early versions of putting this, this transcripting stuff into this console host. Now, in the last preview, we pushed it up a little bit into the engine. And like Jeffrey was saying before, is every engine update we make <laughs> makes the whole ecosystem better. And so, Every app out there that ever, you know, th that ever was written to host the PowerShell engine now supports ubiquitous system-wide transcripting, supports the start transcript command. So if you want to monitor a machine, absolutely set a system-wide variable for the transcript, where it should go to, and now you've got a log of everything input and output that's happened in PowerShell. Yes, question? So that, that includes third-party environments because they're also using the PowerShell engine to execute the commands, right? The question is, does that include third-party environments that run PowerShell commands? And the answer is yes. It includes, you take a little C-sharp app and you run the PowerShell API, PowerShell create, add script, invoke, some random thing that uses PowerShell, that's also going to get logged. When it's, when it's API-driven, some people use the C-sharp versions where it's adding commands and everything else. That gets logged in not as friendly of a way because you're having to make a text version of an API call, but it still gets logged. Now, how many people here have seen the, um, there was an HTML5 prototype we did some time back? It's like a, a bit.ly is a way to kind of bring in PowerShell. So we're, um, I'll show you that a second here. Because it's an interesting way to kind of understand what something's doing. 
So this is a good chance, like, kind of audience participation, play along. So power up your laptops, get them connected. Seriously, open up, get connected. Isn't Dawn about to creep up on you? What's that? Isn't Dawn about to creep up on you? Yeah, it's been creeping up all day. <laughs> Yeah, it's also, HTML5 is pretty good in that it's got audio and stuff. So make sure you've got your speakers on. <laughs> so what I've got here is enabling script block logging. This is currently just editing the, the local group policy. The question was, once the group policy goes into effect, does it impact currently running processes? By default, it doesn't. By default, PowerShell checks when it starts up so that we're not spamming the registry. You can set an environment variable on the system, system-wide if you want. Um, we think probably that's not a good trade-off, but we do support it. So are, are we all web connected? Let's just make sure. Ugh, there we go. <laughs> I probably should have connected before asking you guys. <laughs> <laughs> It's a good thing they tell us that it's taking longer than usual, because I'd never figure that out. <laughs> OK. Anyone else connected? OK. We're going to run this. Type it in, but don't push Enter. Yep. Exactly this, in a PowerShell prompt. Console. What could go wrong? <laughs> 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 and then turn your laptops in for forensic examination on the way out. We're testing prison. So everybody got it? Anybody need, does anybody need extra time? All right, because I got to type this in too. Because we're trying to show what the transcripting can do. Okay, you ready? We're gonna count down. One, two, three, go! Oh! <laughs> you know what? I'm probably being asked to sign in again. That sucks. <laughs> oh god. <laughs> there you go. Oh no, I didn't realize it's going to be on a two pixel screen. Oh man. So yeah, you see some Rick Askey there. <laughs> now what is this thing doing? My goal was not just to Rickroll you all. 
It's groovy. How many hours did you work on that video? Well, um, it took a long time to get my singing right. <laughs> Now here's where the magic has happened. <laughs> now you wonder, how in the world did that happen? And you can actually see here some of the script block logging that we did here. So it shows as PowerShell Engine got the script block, it compiled it, logged it. So this is what the user first typed, invoke web request. Now you can see this and go, what happened here? Then we got a prompt. Now here's where it gets interesting. OK, so I actually got a bunch of stuff here. Creating script block text 11 of 11. This is complicated. This is typically what malware will do, is it will have a stager that goes off to the internet, picks up more stuff, usually is encrypted, decrypted, runs some more stuff. Now PowerShell has logged each of those situations, and now you're able to actually, in a, in a SEM or your later analysis, and go find out what happened. And the, the power, powerful thing here, you've got some event data but all of the important stuff, <clears throat> excuse me, is also logged as properties on the event log. So every compilation has a unique script block ID. And what we can do here Get when event is a great way to start digging against the registry. So here are all the events of script block compilation that have been logged in the system. So these things, for example, could have gone, this could be a query that you're actually running against a collector and doing some just really lightweight analysis there. Now the magical thing here is when we start to be able to compose this stuff easily. So let me show you. The things that come back from get win event are these event log messages. Now you see at the top the message. That is kind of the compiled chunk just for really visual purposes when you're in the event log. But where the really useful stuff comes out is the properties array. So ETW, which is event tracing for Windows, all the events that are logged store all of the important stuff in properties. And then the, the message itself is usually just a two-string version of these things. So our event logs for compilation include how many script blocks. So this is, um, we break the script blocks into chunks because ETW can only handle chunks of such a size. So this is event log message one.
of one. The, the thing that we compiled was a prompt. And here was a script block ID. So let's pretend that you've found something that you're interested in. Now you can join up based on this script block ID. So this backticky weird thing was interesting. So let's figure this one out. So here R was my, my list of events. Now I'm just checking for, you know, whenever the script block ID was that one that I was interested in. Okay, so now we have the list of things that happened in that one compilation that we're kind of concerned about. Now there's the actual text itself. We just pulled out the compiled text. We'll put it into the clipboard to get more understanding of what it's doing. Now we can paste it, and you can actually see here, well, that's kind of pattern. Oh, no, no pattern. Just use your brain a little bit here. Oh, that's suspicious. Oh, man, there's Rick Askey jumping across. <laughs> so that's in reverse order of, of execution, and you can actually see what bootstrapped the whole thing at the end. So there's an example of you know, setting up an event log collector, dumping a bunch of stuff from your machines into a collector, analyzing new events using PowerShell, and being able to see at all points of interactive commands and deobfuscation exactly what PowerShell has done on that system. Jeffrey's question was, is that ID uh, some sort of hash of what we actually compiled? Or is it just some unique ID that we made up? And the answer is that it's a unique ID that we made up um, just because it's easier to guarantee that they're unique when you merge these things up in systems. The invocation of this is unique enough in terms of the time who did it that it's important to disambiguate from something else. and these. If you wanted to, you could have a content ID, but a lot of times what you want in terms of a content ID is some sort of string matching later on based on the content itself. Any other questions? Yes? You mentioned uh, before about untrusted domains. Did you cover that? Uh, sure, so the question is, how do you actually do this with untrusted domains? Mm -hmm. Right, so uh, the answer is that you need to set up the, the computers to talk to a collector, and you can give it any URL. I, ideally, you set that up, WS Man, you can set it up to listen on SSL, give it a certificate, and these things can talk over SSL. WS Man can speak over anything HTTP. So, for example, PowerShell Remoting easily talks over the internet to exchange online. Now, if, if you don't want to do an SSL cert, what you can also do is set up a cert, a client-based certificate in that certificate selection window that was kind of midway there. Anything else? Awesome. Oh, sorry, one more. Yeah, this is kind of going back to the beginning almost. So with like OneGet and PowerShell Get, kind of encouraging people to go download all this stuff that's not necessarily trusted um, and I'm not sure how that then blocked the way is there a question mark there around making that more secure then and also we, before earlier on we've been looking at DSC Azure conflicts with all their embedded passwords and is there any move to have a more secure mechanisms embedded in there because I mean it's a problem across the enterprise about it and everyone's embedding passwords here I know you can encrypt your web.config 
Yeah, so the, the first question was around, do we need to be worried about security for you know, PSGET and OneGET and everything else? And the answer is emphatically yes. Microsoft cannot make a statement that everything on any repository is secure. It's the same thing with apt-get or any, any package manager ever. If the user has the ability to get, you know, if you're worried about the version of sys internals that they're getting, they could do the same thing by going to some dodgy website and going, this sounds legit. Yeah, but if it was signed with, micro, if you had it signed with one of Microsoft's keys, then that would add a certain more legitimacy to the source yes. of that. Yeah, so, you know, we're absolutely thinking further in that level. Um, what we can do, it's, it's early days, but we do want the ability for people to make easier trust decisions that don't involve a ton of code review. And then the second question was around, what are we doing around encrypted certs and people who are leaving all this junk in their files? And that's been a battle that we've been waging actually since the first version of PowerShell. So you'll notice that every sensitive command in PowerShell takes a dash credential. It doesn't take a dash user, it doesn't take dash password. So it's already difficult to get these things into one of these config docs. Um, what people used to do was start to do, given that a credential took a secure string, well then they would just embed in their script, convert to secure string as plain text, and then their actual password. What we did in version three to make that a lot easier is the ability to import and export credentials. So I said $C equals get credential. Now I can just say export CLI XML, and that will become mm -hmm. a structured credential on disk in a file. And that uses the data protection API in Windows. It's a very, very secure way. If you give that file to anybody else on another computer, they can't read it. If you give it to another user on your same computer, they can't read it. It's encrypted with your user and your computer alone. So in order for those things to fall into the wrong hand, there needs to be actually malware running on your computer or having taken over the computer and just totally busted the whole data protection. But that makes it a lot easier to have a script stored up in you know, Azure or a blob or whatever that has all the code except one part where it says import PS or import CLI XML of a credential file. <coughs> so a lot of good stuff. There's also a really great, I'll show you some of the, um, the references here. So the one I was talking about from Andy, investigating PowerShell attacks, that goes more into some of the PowerShell events that are made in terms of remoting connections and everything else. That's, like I was saying, it's a subset of the broader things that you want to monitor and be careful about on a Windows set of computers. Those are covered really well in spotting the adversary with Windows event log. There's the group policy settings that talk about how to set any of the PowerShell ones up. One thing I didn't mention here was we did a PowerShell presentation a while back at an internal security conference called Blue Hat. And I had about 20 minutes to just blast through a bunch of security stuff in terms of how to use, but just really use PowerShell securely in terms of uh, credential handling, properly escaping script content. So search for uh, you know, PowerShell security on the blog. It was one of the most recent ones. So that's a great, they put it up, it's 20 minutes, so good use of your time. So thanks. <laughs>